I'm going to uh, jump right in, and we're going to go through a few different cases where we're going to present some serious infections, and we're going to take you through some clinical decision making and try to see how things might have unfolded differently had susceptibility results been present earlier. Start out with our first case, uh, who it was a nursing home patient with pneumonia. First day of hospitalization, uh, this uh, gentleman with COPD is admitted from skilled nursing facility with shortness of breath and lethargy. Of note, prior antibiotics uh, of note were ciprofloxacin, which a seven-day course had been completed about five days prior to admission. In addition to the lethargy and shortness of breath, the patient has a fever and is hypotensive. Uh, pressors are started in the emergency department. The patient is intubated and mechanically advent, uh, uh, vent ventilated and is admitted to the ICU with pneumonia and is started on broad spectrum antimicrobial therapy with meropenem, gentamicin, and vancomycin. The next day, blood cultures return positive for gram-negative rods. There is rapid, rapid diagnostics are performed, which identifies the organism as Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And other relevant results for the Pseudomonas are that it is negative for KPC, IMP, and VIM. Patient goes into acute kidney injury or develops AKI, but otherwise, Clinical status really is unchanged, remains intubated and non-pressors. Vancomycin and genomycin are discontinued, and meropenem is continued as monotherapy based on the rapid diagnostic results. On hospital day three, the patient is doing worse. He's now maxed out on pressors. Pressor requirements have increased, as has his um, oxygenation and ventilation requirements. On this day, hospital day three, culture and susceptibility results return as well. You can see here uh, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa is resistant to cefabeam, piperacillin tazobactam, meropenem, and ciprofloxacin, but is susceptible to tobramycin. At this point, meropenem is discontinued, and the patient is started on colistin and tobramycin. Patient eventually stabilizes, but has a prolonged ICU stay, and is eventually discharged to an LTAC on hospital day 25. So playing Monday morning quarterback a little bit, let's look back and try to see exactly what happened and what opportunities uh, there might have been had more information been available earlier. Well, we know the patient had a healthcare-associated pneumonia because of his long-term care um, residence status, and it turns out that he ended up having pneumonia and bacteremia due to a resistant strain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The clinicians reacted to a negative rapid diagnostic finding, re, you know, the no carbipenemase, no KPC, and mistakenly thought or interpreted that as meaning carbipenem susceptible, which obviously was not the case. The patient had uh, not clinically improved, but had developed acute kidney injury. And um, I, I think it's pretty common, particularly when you have multiple nephrotoxic agents. We know vancomycin, particularly in the presence of aminoglycoside, is a particularly um, a nephrotoxic that those agents were stopped. And stopping the aminoglycoside inadvertently was stopping um, effective therapy. And as a result, the patient's clinical status de deteriorated. So how might outcomes for case one have been improved? Well, I think if susceptibility results had been available on hospital day, day two, there's a good chance that aminoglycosides would have been continued in spite of the AKI. Other agents might have been added, um, possibly uh, polymyxins or possibly one of the newer beta-lactam, ceftolozane, tazobactam. We know that time to effective therapy and maintaining effective therapy in the first few days of sepsis is critically important in terms of uh, positively impacting clinical outcomes and uh, having susceptibility results earlier uh, might have facilitated the maintenance of effective therapy. 
We're going to be taking a closer look at mechanistically in terms of resistance and also from PKPD perspectives in the subsequent talks. We're going to move now uh, to case two. Uh, case two is a little bit different flavor. It's a 60-year-old uh, gentleman who lives at home who undergoes a right-sided colectomy for colon cancer. He uh, is admitted to the hospital from the PACU and otherwise is stable. Of note, the patient did receive three doses of cefazolin perioperatively. Two days later, on hospital day three, the patient spikes a fever and the abdominal wound has purulent drainage. And not, um, I think it's quite believable that blood cultures were sent, but uh, the wound was not cultured because it couldn't be the wound. Um, that, that often is what we hear sometimes from our surgeons or from our intensivists um, thought to be maybe post-operative uh, serosanguineous drainage. Patient of blood culture set and antibiotics were uh, empirically started uh, broad coverage with vancomycin and zosin. On hospital day four, the patient remains febrile and still has abdominal drainage, but blood cultures come back positive for two pathogens, a gram-negative rod as well as a gram-positive co coccus. Rapid diagnostics identify E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. This um, also reports are MECA positive and CTXM negative. In the micro lab, the polymicrobial culture is re-incubated, and clinically, the patient has a CAT scan performed. It's a nonspecific showing a fluid collection deep to the incision, which might is consistent with post-operative inflammatory changes, but abscess cannot be ruled out. Based on the rapid diagnostic results and the CT findings, decision is made to continue vancomycin Zosin is uh, stopped and ceftriaxone is started, and the decision is made to uh, keep watching the patient closely to observe for clinical progress. Remember, this is hospital day four. Blood cultures were sent on hospital day three. Two days later on hospital day six, patient remains intermittently spiking fevers and now has increasing abdominal pain. And on hospital day six, the culture results return. And for the E. coli, susceptibility results are as follows. Resistant to cefepime, piperacillin and tazobactam, susceptible to meropenem, resistant to ciprofloxacin, and susceptible to gentamicin. The staph aureus susceptibility results return, not surprisingly, it's cefazolin resistant, levofloxacin resistant, susceptible to vancomycin with an MIC of two, and susceptible to daptomycin with an MIC of 0.5. Antimicrobials are changed to daptomycin and ertapenem at this time. Patient um, eventually goes to the OR and has the abscess drained. A patient ends up uh, being discharged on hospital day 15 to a skilled nursing facility, but spends several days in the ICU uh, before discharge. So again, playing Monday morning quarterback, what exactly happened in this case and how might have the patient been managed differently had susceptibility results been available earlier? Well, we know the patient had a polymicrobial surgical site infection with uh, what turned out to be an abscess. CT findings, not surprisingly, were nonspecific. Difficult to differentiate post-operative inflammatory changes or uh, fluid collections from true abscesses. And the rapid diagnostic results were interpreted by the clinicians as indicating that the patient currently, with the current therapy, was on effective empiric treatment. We know that the MECA positive means we're dealing with MRSA, and uh, since vancomycin resistance staphoreus is very rare, um, vancomycin seemed to be reasonable. Uh, again, the MICs were not present at this time, um, but we knew that it was probably susceptible to vanco by current breakpoints. The E. coli was CTXM negative, and the uh, lack of a C CTXM was interpreted as meaning that the organism was cephalosporin susceptible. I know at our institution, as well as others around the country, that uh, zosin is on shortage, so we aggressively 
uh, try to minimize our use of this drug. And given the fact that there was no CTXM and thus probably no ESBL, it seemed reasonable to narrow coverage at that time to a third generation cephalosporin. I think a further complicating factor in this case in terms of prolonging time until susceptibility results were available was the fact that it was a polymicrobial culture that there need to be subculture reincubated to accurately identify and to get uh, antimicrobial susceptibilities for each pathogen. So instead of having um, susceptibilities and definitive pathogen identification back about 24 hours after initial uh, culture results, we're dealing more with 48 hours. So we're an additional 24 hour delay uh, due to the reincubation of the cultures after um, rapid diagnostic results. Turned out that the patient was on suboptimal therapy at this institution, according to their stewardship guidelines, uh, MRSA bacteremia with an MIC of two, um, it's preferred to treat with daptomycin if the patient is not obviously clinically improving or clearing his blood. I think less controversial, um, the ceftriaxone clearly was not active against the E. coli strain, um, so obviously, had we known this, a uh, patient might have been switched to an agent like a carbipenem rather than to a third generation cephalosporin. So how might of outcomes for case two been improved? Well, again, if we had susceptibility results on day four instead of day six, antibiotics might have been changed at that time to the definitive regimen of daptomycin plus a carbipenem, which was erdipenem in this case. Again, because it was a polymicrobial culture, polymicrobial infection, there was a further delay in the standard clinical microbiology laboratory susceptibility result testing, and having those susceptibility results more rapidly available would have decreased the time to effective therapy, which might have uh, had significant clinical impact on the patient, potentially getting him out of the ICU and the hospital more quickly, uh, maybe even getting him home instead of to a skilled nursing facility. So these are the two cases that I wanted to cover. Um, I will turn it now over to uh, Steve Metzger, who's going to talk about high-speed phenotypic susceptibilities.